Latter-day Contemplation is a podcast hosted by two Latter-day Saints who have found great value in experiencing God through walking a path of contemplation. The views expressed herein are our own. Hello and welcome to Latter-day Contemplation. We are your hosts, Christopher Hurtado and Riley Risto. Latter-day Contemplation started as an exploration of contemplative practices from many traditions to enhance our discipleship of Jesus Christ. We're by no means experts in the topics we discuss, but what we have is an openness to questions, a hunger to discover truth wherever we can find it, and a desire to share in the transformative life of inner peace. We love that you've joined us, and we hope that you find value in this community. Hello and welcome back to Latter-day Contemplation. I'm Riley Risto. And I'm Christopher Hurtado. And today we're going to be speaking about the importance of mentors and gurus. Chris, you've had plenty of those in your life, haven't you? I have. I'm really excited to talk about this topic because mentors have been so important to me in my spiritual and intellectual progress. I, too, have had at least a dozen that I can think about just offhand in various contexts of my life, whether it's professional or spiritual or uh, family or whatever, to have someone who you perceive as being uh, more advanced in that field, give you guidance, can be really helpful in avoiding some of the pitfalls of progression. Yeah, absolutely. Someone who's just a little bit further ahead than you to a lot further ahead. As far as you're concerned, as long as they're a little bit further ahead on the path that you want to be on, whether it's it's a, whether they know something you want to know or whether they be or are something that you want to be, that can be helpful. Right. Is Is there any... I would I would assume there's risks to engaging into a relationship with a mentor or a guru, but what can you think of offhand as being some possible risks of, of seeking out that type of relationship? Well, of course, you can end up in a, in a position where you are trusting someone who's not trustworthy. That's, that's important to think about. And so you do have to be careful in choosing a mentor. And, and you as, uh, would assess that by interaction with that person. And so that, that process of choosing a mentor or a guru is kind of important to actually go through a process or have some type of method for choosing a mentor before you just engage in, in that relationship based on a first impression, I guess. Yeah, and let's go ahead and problematize this a little bit. For our audience, you know, for a Latter-day Saint audience, our intended audience, you, on the one hand, that which is taught at church is basic, and that's acknowledged by the church. That's what the church is for. And it, it, it is up to us to, as Brigham Young put it, to become profound theologians. So if we're supposed to do that, and that's not taught at church, um, and by the way, if you didn't know this, if you keep going back to church waiting for the meat to show up, and you think you've had plenty of milk, then you, you've missed the point here that the church is there to give the milk, and the meat is something you have to seek on your own. And when I say on your own, a mentor can be a huge help in that, right? So we have this standard as Latter-day Saints that we're going to look to the approved sources, so to speak. Does that make sense to put it that way, Riley? Sure. And yet, when we're looking for a mentor, we have to, in some sense, be able to go outside of that, right? It's kind of tricky, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, bought, I've purchased a lot of books in my day, as you have. And I can't think of any that I ever purchased, and, and I'm sure that they exist, but I can't think of any that I purchased at Deseret Book that really expanded beyond that basics into kind of that deeper meat of the gospel. I don't know. Can you? No, they really don't. As a matter of fact, uh, one of my mentors, who is a Latter-day Saint, said, I won't name names, he said, if you've read one, you've read them all. There is a sense in which they sort of just quote each other. Even if you want to study the historical Jesus, for example, the what's the go-to book in, in the Latter-day Saint tradition? It's Talmadge's book. Well, Talmadge's book is based on Farrar, and it's an outdated source. Right. And But it's become, it's become canonical. And so all you can do is quote that, and it's kind of hard to be published by Deseret Book and, and go outside of those bounds, right? And this is in no way to bag on Deseret Book. We don't need a lawsuit for defamation or anything like that. Deseret Book's great, whatever. The, the point being that if you're going to progress beyond the milk, you, you need to have some way to evaluate the source of information and know where to get it. And so that's where these, these mentor-protege relationships come into play. So how do you go about finding one, choosing one? 
You know, that's a, that for me, that's a tricky question too, because, well, I've already problematized that a little bit, right? How do you, how do you vet a mentor, right? Typically you're going to be, I feel like my, my mentors have sort of come to me. They sort of show up. There's this, there's a saying we've all heard when the pupil is ready, the master will appear, right? And so that's what, that's, that's been my experience when I'm ready to push through the next barrier to, you know, break through the next glass ceiling in my development, whether intellectually or spiritually, someone's always shown up right on time. And then there are other times that I've actually left mentors behind. And, and then again, that's still that moment of in letting that mentor go, I'm signaling that I'm signaling that I'm ready for a new mentor. And then that mentor shows up. What do you do, Riley? How do you, what's your experience? I think my experience is pretty similar to that. I guess I would preface it by saying one of the important things for me is to always maintain an open mindset. And that doesn't even necessarily mean that I just accept what someone teaches me when it's outside of my normal bounds of understanding, but that I'm willing to listen and you know sit with that for a little while and even acknowledge that the other person speaking to me, that's how they feel and that's that's what they understand to be true. And if I can be with them long enough and and listen to enough of that, many times what happens is I, I, through the process of reconciliation in discussion and dialectic and dialogue back and forth, a lot of times I start to agree with them. It's funny how that works, huh? When you discuss things with people, you find a lot of agreement. Sure. And here's something else, Riley, you know, as a a philosopher, we, we distinguish between a misunderstanding and a disagreement in order to in order to significantly disagree to actually disagree you have to have actually understood so oftentimes we feel like we're in disagreement when we actually are in misunderstanding and so we have to seek first to understand as covey taught us right and in seeking first to understand if we really are willing to open up to the possibility of what is being put forward and truly understand it then we could actually disagree meaningfully so we do have to be open. Now, and, and of course, there's this other piece of advice that I've heard, which is, you know, keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. There is that too, right? Especially in getting caught up in some kind of emotional, when I think about a guru, the kind of mentor that's more spiritual, that's more religious, and, and call that a guru, you can really get caught up. I mean, this is how cults happen, right? You can get caught up in some kind of emotional attachment. Not that you don't have an attachment with a mentor, that there, there can be a very healthy, very very loving relationship. I feel such great love, such deep love and appreciation for my mentors. I have had that those feelings, you know? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that word of caution because I, I do think there's a, a religious or devotional connotation to the word guru, and maybe that's why we've shied away from that, that... Uh, moniker ourselves when, I mean, if you've listened to us long enough, you've heard us say a dozen times, we are not your gurus. And I I think it's because we don't want to be looked at in that devotional sort of way, but in as much as we're providing information for other people that is helpful to them or leads them in a direction that they find to be positive, there's there's some type of mentorship going on there. Let's talk a little bit about the traditional mentor or guru disciple relationship. So first, I can say Jesus is my guru, and that's easy, right? Uh, the problem is that I can't actually e- exist in the kind of traditional guru-disciple relationship with him because I can't actually literally sit at his feet. And not only, I mean, there's a sense in which I can take in his teachings through not only through the scriptures, but through the Holy Ghost. But what I can't do is there's no way in which he's there physically present to to kind of gauge me and decide when to give me further light and truth is that even true i mean this happens <laughs> i can feel your the holy own, ghost right i can feel your internal uh alarms going off saying part of that's true part of it's not like you're trying to reconcile it for yourself <laughs> it really is tricky there i guess what i'm saying is there really is a place for uh something like a guru but i think ultimately as latter-day saints our guru is christ so I think if I were to if I were to find myself in a in a guru disciple mentoring relationship, I would have in mind that this guru that I'm that I'm face to face with is a his guru is Christ. Perfect. And by the way, that's 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 actually, of course, a way to decide whether or not I would choose this person as my mentor or guru. Right? That has to be really clear. Yeah. No, I love that because 
it, to the extent that the guru is, you know, trying to heap more acclaim on himself, I think that's a big red flag for me. It's like, okay, this isn't about them. This is actually about me and my growth and development, you know, and if the focus is on my growth and development, then I, I think I can trust that kind of a source. But the, the moment it, it becomes about them, uh, I, I get a little nervous. And you would want it to be about uh, building the kingdom too, not just bu- building you up, of course, but in the sense that that's kingdom building, yeah. right? That's building up the kingdom of God. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I mean, I love that connection you made between, uh, you know, your guru and your guru's guru. Like, yeah, because I can actually right? think of a, a person that I'm studying right now, you know, not living, but again, giving me insight into my guru, which is Christ. And one could look at him and say, yeah, he's, he's kind of a guru. You know, he's a model of the knowledge he's trying to impart. And uh, that's, that's very much what a guru does. They live by example. And uh, I, there's nothing wrong with that. But the, the beautiful thing in my relationship with that person, who again is deceased, is that their guru was Christ. And so they were tapping into something that I want to tap into ultimately. Yeah, here's another point, Riley, when it comes to, can I really just learn the mysteries of the kingdom that Jesus speaks of through the scriptures? The problem with mysteries, as we've covered before on this podcast, is that they are things that actually can't be put into words. And so the words are there to point to them, but I still may not see them. And so because scriptures actually have to be interpreted, then a guru, a guru can be someone who has been able to interpret those scriptures such that, he, such that they've been able to pull out the mysteries and show them to me. That's well, and possible. I think within our culture, we've put that responsibility on the apostles and prophets. Historically, we've kind of said those people are the interpreters of scripture. And yet we've re- arrived at a contradiction in saying that, right? Because we've said that the church also teaches us plainly that the church is there to teach us the basics. Yeah. And that it's up to us to go seek further light and truth. And and we've already covered that we can't necessarily find it. And when we say Deseret Book, we don't mean it's not about Deseret Book. It's about... Right. Not about the company. No, it's a, it, this is a shorthand for sort of these these sources. Because I've had people tell me that, that they felt like they weren't allowed. I'm talking about Latter-day Saints when I say people. Latter-day Saints have told me that they don't feel like they're allowed to go outside of those sources that we're, that we're calling Deseret Book sources as a shorthand, right? That, they, that they're not allowed to do that, that they've been told not to look to other sources. Now, of course, there's a danger in looking outside of those sources in some sense, but there's no progress beyond what those sources are, which is the basics, without it. So you do have to take on that risk. And of course, the bottom line in in all of this is to be led by the Spirit, to be guided by the Spirit, and to trust that you can have that relationship with the Spirit and with with God, with with the divine, straight from the source. We're all taught by the church that we can have that and that we can do that. So it's interesting. And another thing about that, Riley, is that there are so many teachings that, and Terrell Givens brought these out in his book, The Crucible of Doubt. There are so many teachings from the prophets that contradict those who have said, among them I can think of Ezra Taft Benson and his 14, what is it, 14 principles of following the prophet or something like that, which was controversial from the time it was given. Even Spencer W. Kimball had something to say about it, against it. And that is that this idea that once the prophet is spoken, that's all there is to say. Right? This, this teaching has been repudiated by the prophets themselves. The prophets themselves tell us that they are not infallible. In other words, that they are not the be-all, end-all source of truth, just like we've talked about on the podcast before, Riley, that even the scriptures are a jumping-off point. Remember especially section 76? Yes. Yeah, so section 76, where there's this vision that opens up to Sydney, uh, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon that has really nothing to do with, I mean, it has something to do with their read. They're reading about two kingdoms, heaven and hell, right? That's it. And they get this further light and truth of these three degrees of glory that has, that's really contradictory to what they're reading, you know, in black and white in the scriptures. And so that scripture was just a jumping off point. And so what are the the prophets, but living scriptures in a sense, right? The, the words of the prophets are considered to be living scriptures, and yet they're not infallible, and neither are the ones that are canonized. No, that's that's a great explanation. I think that I've used, you know, general authorities, apostles, prophets, 
uh, for for that jumping off point many times where they, they plant an idea in your head and you go and explore it further and it turns into something that it is completely different than it started out as. And that's a great process to have. And that's actually something that mentors can do for us is, is to give us that spark, which then turns into a bonfire later on. So Exactly. Yeah. Great. Or we come to, or we come with the spark sometimes and the mentor throws the gasoline on it. Sure. Right? Either or. So why would someone want to become a mentor? I mean, it seems like a very one-way relationship, but is there more to it? Yeah, it's actually surprising how much of a benefit there is to to one who becomes a mentor. This is something that's not readily apparent. I can think of one thing, for example, that, that really is pretty big. I mean, this thing alone would be enough, but there's actually, I think there's more. I have, um, I have a book, some notes from a book that I looked at once uh, that, that cover a whole list of, of and we can mention the book and, and recommend it. Mentoring the most obvious yet overlooked key to achieving more in life than you dreamed possible by Floyd Wickman and Terry Shioden. Yeah, that that's a great book. And so one of the things that it points out that I remember off the top of my head is that, and, and also because I've experienced it, and when, when someone has come to me in my area of expertise in Islamic studies, and, and I can think of a particular person that I mentored that just was sincerely seeking when there were so many, so many opinions on Facebook, you know, and so many negative things and so many misleading things. And and this person just got a sense, this isn't really the right way to learn about this. Where do I turn? And they turned to me and they asked me questions they were sincerely seeking. And I was willing to spend my time to answer their questions because they were sincerely seeking. But what what happens for me is this sharpens me. I can think of another example. When Come Follow Me uh, first began, I ended up forming a study group, and that was around. It occurred because a sister in my ward started asking me poignant, incisive questions. And because she saw me as someone who would know the answers to those questions, because she knew that I knew maybe a little bit more than she did about the scriptures. And, and maybe the linguistics would be something that I could tell her about. A lot of the questions that I get are typically around that, too, because people know that I know uh, lang- uh, languages, right? So I've studied 12 languages. I have varying degrees of fluency in, in, in 12 languages. So with that, I didn't necessarily know or, or didn't feel like I knew, or maybe I wanted to know more than I knew to answer her question. And so that made me have to then go and study. And I thought, this is great because I love to learn and I love to teach and I love to learn by teaching. Teaching is a great way to learn. So she trusted me. I went and did the homework I answered her questions, and it just became a study group. As other people got involved, and we ended up doing this. And so there is a mentoring relationship there in any kind of teaching relationship. Yeah, I've found that, like you, it helps me to keep my pencil really sharp. I mean, if someone asks me a question, and I'm the one that's going to provide them an answer, I better be confident in that answer. And so it forces me to go back and just really sharpen that pencil, make sure that what I'm sharing with others, because there's a responsibility attached to that that doesn't affect you as much when it's just yourself. You know, obviously you want to have good information, but when you're giving that information to other people, you want to be doubly sure that it's the right information. You know, it occurs to me that I I should clarify something. I said that in any teaching relationship, there's a mentor relationship, and that's not exactly true, right? Because the, the thing that's different about a teacher and and between a teacher and a mentor is that a mentoring relationship is more personal. And so a a teacher can be lecturing before a class, a mentoring relationship, a mentor protege relationship is more personal. And that's what, that's one thing. So this is a benefit instead of a benefit to the mentor, it's a, a benefit to the person who's being mentored is that the mentor takes a personal interest in them. And that's huge, right? To have someone who knows more than you or who bees more than you in, what, in the areas that you would, would like to ha- know more or be more uh, or be something or know something, that they can actually take a personal interest, you know, a vested interest in, in getting you from point A and helping you get from point A to point B. Not just to give you information, but to, to really take a personal interest. Yeah. And I, that's been huge for me. I've tried to think through what are the benefits um, of, of seeing someone else you know, progress and, and have success, there's, there's kind of like the psychic, emotional, psychological benefit inside that, man, you had a stake in that. And it feels really good to see someone 
do that. But I think there's also another level to that in that book that you mentioned, um, mentoring the most obvious yet overlooked key to achieving more in life than you dreamed possible. There was one specific benefit that I just wanted to highlight. And I, to give deference to the author, I'm just going to quote it word for word. It says, as a mentor, when you help a protege answer the next stage of his life or career, you will enter the next stage of yours. And maybe that's not something we think about very often as being a benefit of being a mentor, but that that spoke to me as being true, that it helps you into your next stage of progression when you see your protege enter theirs. That's interesting. Yeah, I think there was a, a sense in which, well, okay, this is to take it down a notch. There's a sense in which it helped me to, again, rise to the occasion of someone asking me to be a mentor in, in a certain situation, right? When it came to answering questions about come follow me reading. But yeah, once they, if they would reach that next level, well, then that again helps push you to the next level in your own development too. And there's a great sense of satisfaction that you touched on, but I have to say, as a teacher of many years, mentoring is teaching, not all teaching is mentoring, but all mentoring is teaching. And whether I've been a teacher or whether I've been a mentor, there's a huge sense of satisfaction that you derive from someone else making progress. Every teacher wants to see a student learn, and not every student wants to learn, unfortunately. Many, many students are in a situation where they're just going through the motions and they're just, they're just there to do whatever they have to do to, to get to the next step. And the next step for them is not necessarily education. It's maybe a piece of paper or whatever. So when you take, you know, as a teacher... I often entered into more personal relationships with some of my students. Say you have a class of 30 as a college instructor, you might end up mentoring two or three of them. The ones who really want to learn are going to come to you outside of class. They're going to, they're going to do good work. They're going to want to talk to you about it. Some of them just want to talk to you about their, you know, they just want to have a conversation where they pretend to be interested in learning so they can figure out what it is that they have to do to get a better grade or whatever. But some of them really want to learn more, and so they come to you because they realize that, that there's more that, that they could learn from you than what you're teaching in class, which makes me think again of church. You know, you know, I can go to church and I can learn what's being taught at church, but I have to know that there's more, right? There's more, uh, and that's, again, that's not something that, that we're saying. That's something that the church itself is telling us, that there's more that we have to go seek and find on our own. It seems like that's a basic truism. I mean... I don't know how many classes I've taught where I, I teach a certain level of understanding because I'm teaching to a group. And again, I've said many times that when I'm teaching in Sunday school, I don't like to lob grenades. I'm not trying to destroy people's testimonies or whatever. So there's a level of frankness I have in a one-to-one -one personal conversation versus what I might have to a group. And I think that's probably true of any teacher-student type relationship in, in the larger extended setting. And so you've talked about levels implicitly here. You, there's the student-teacher relationship. There's the, there's the mentor-protege relationship. And then there's the guru-disciple relationship. And there's levels to that. The guru-disciple has some devotion. The, the protege-mentor has commitments about what they're going to do or study or become or whatever. The student-teacher can be very surface level, not much going on. There. Just delivering information, right? Right. Yeah, just a lecture is literally a reading, right? I've got my lecture notes. I'm going to lecture to you. You're going to take notes. And it's very transactional in a sense, right? It's not necessarily personally transformational. It can be. Again, it depends on the student, right? And, and it's interesting to note that just like lecture comes from the Latin lectio, which, you know, we've talked about lectio divina, divine reading. The, the word student, it actually means, it comes from studeo, studere, which really means to be zealous. So to be a true student, you're zealously seeking knowledge, is what I always tell my students, to, to help them, you know, to, to, to help them decide who they are. Who are you going to be in this relationship, right? Are you going to be a true student, or are you just here in a transactional relationship, looking for a transactional relationship, or do you want you know, to, to actually enter into a, a, a mentoring relationship. And I've always been willing to give of my time to any student who really was seeking outside of class, doesn't matter how much time. I don't get paid for that time as, a, as an adjunct instructor. Don't get paid for that time. But I was more than happy to give it to anyone who's truly seeking. Because again, any teacher, any mentor has that investment that we pointed out as a benefit to mentoring, that is that they are going to get their own satisfaction out of seeing who they're teaching or mentoring progress, and that it's going to help them to go to the next level in their own progression at the same time. 
So within the religious connotation or context of, of this mentor uh, guru type relationship, I, I'm thinking back in history within within the church or uh, you know especially within our own church, like who are who are the the mentors of our mentors you know and I, I we had a brief conversation about this in the pre-show about about Joseph Smith and in our in our present time we tend to look back and say well Joseph Smith he's he was like the mentor right but there was a lot of people following Joseph Smith and then there was a lot of people that were mentoring Joseph Smith during that time I mean we, we sometimes forget that he was a young guy you know I mean during most of this time serving as a, a prophet in the during the restoration, he was a fairly young guy, uh, my age and younger. And so during that time, he had people who had, who had lived more than him, experienced more than him, uh, certainly learned more than him from an academic standpoint that kind of mentored him along and helped him to fulfill his potential. Um, and, you know, that's, that's an interesting model for, for maybe where we're at today. If, if you're going to look at someone as your mentor, mentor realize that they've probably got mentors themselves and and not to set up these cults of personality necessarily yeah you know if i think about who who were mentors to joseph smith the first one that comes to my mind is actually his father and i think this is interesting to talk about because oftentimes in in classical education it's been said that a mentor is more important than a father when it comes to education the father is very important and and yet and a father teaches one many things that one needs to learn. But when it comes to education itself, a mentor can be more important than a father. You can think about somebody like Thomas Jefferson. His father gave him Greek and Latin, which he said was the greatest gift that he ever received from his father, which is, you know, opened up so much to him in terms of the, the pleasure of reading those sources in the originals. But I think about his relationship with George Wythe, and that's the relationship that really formed him as a thinker, right? That his education was through his relationship with George Wythe as a mentor. And so with Joseph Smith, sometimes the father can be more than a father. He can be a mentor, right? It depends, again, on what it is you're trying to learn and what it is that your father knows. And I think in Joseph Smith's case, his father certainly did mentor him. I think I think we can say his father was one of his mentors. What do you think, Riley? Yeah, my first thought went to Sidney Rigdon, just as someone who was very educated and had that gift of of writing and speaking that uh, that Joseph Smith looked up to and, and used many times. In fact, a lot of times with our historical church documents, you know, the the experts are still trying to parse out what was written by him, what was written by Joseph, because there was such an adoption of that style. And I mean, you, I can tell the difference. And I think a lot of people can tell the difference when you're reading something that's been identified as having come from Sidney Rigdon versus something that came from Joseph. There's almost a, a scientific approach to it when it when you're reading something that comes straight from uh, Sidney Rigdon. But anyway, that's that's one thought I had uh, there. And you know, Brigham Young, you could say the same thing about him with Joseph and others. Um, but they all, at one point or another, had mentors themselves. And if that doesn't highlight the, the need for an importance of mentorship with, within the church even, I'm not sure what else would. So that, that's interesting to me. Yeah, you know, I'll, give, uh, there, I'll say something more about that too. Sidney Rigdon was one of, one of a few mentors that Joseph Smith had who were already Christian preachers. Right, who had training and or experience as Christian preachers. Right. Wasn't he a Campbellite? I'm not sure, but a few a few of them were uh Methodist. Uh but they were they were definitely they were either trained and or experienced as preachers. And so that's and and, and, as, and as, even as theologians. So Joseph Smith is receiving re revelation. Well, we've already talked about the mysteries of God as things that can't actually be put into words, and yet you have to put something down on paper. You have to be able to say something to share these things. And the language that you use is the language that you have. And Joseph Smith's language through these mentors expands into a theological vocabulary. I think we can say that. And so we see we can see that happening. And again, that's through his mentors. Mm. He has another mentor when he wants to learn Hebrew. 
You want to learn Hebrew, you want to learn, learn a new language, you need somebody who knows that language and who can teach you. And if you're entering into a one-on-one -on -one relationship, you know, we can call this tutoring, we can call it mentoring. It depends on how much of a personal interest the, the teacher takes in you. If we, if we can say that, the, that his Hebrew teacher took a personal interest in Joseph, then we can say that he was in a mentor-protege relationship. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think that same gentleman went to Nauvoo and was teaching the, the school of the prophets, uh, if I remember right. But um, nevertheless, yeah, being able to uh, reach out for sources that you believe have some authority in those topics and have them enter into that relationship with you, it does a lot for both parties. So very important even within the church that we that we develop and nurture these mentor-protege relationships. And I've found that, you know, those have come naturally as a consequence of just fulfilling callings. Um, when I was a young men's president, I would have young men approach me after a lesson or an activity and ask me something. When I was a, uh, or a, as I am now, a gospel doctrine teacher, I would have people come to me after lessons and ask me more detail about something. And then that expands into going to lunch once a week and learning more about whatever topics they're interested in. And you, you feed off each other in those relationships. Those are great. But uh, those are fostered sometimes in just the normal course of fulfilling your callings. Yeah, you know, now that you've mentioned the School of the Prophets, B.H. Roberts comes to mind. The 70s course in theology that he wrote for the School of the Prophets, this is not Joseph Smith. And yet, once they're working together in, in the relationship that they're in, there's a sense in which B.H. Roberts can be said to be mentoring Joseph and that kind of that kind of language, that kind of vocabulary, that kind of structure of thought enters into the mainstream of what is now LDS theology. If we can call something LDS theology, that's been a matter of dispute whether there's an LDS theology because theology is supposed to be some is supposed to be something closed, whereas uh, continuing revelation would be the opposite. And yet we have LDS theologians, starting with B.H. Roberts, and we have Sterling McMurrin as another example, a more recent example. And so it's interesting to think about how when we talk about going outside of the, the LDS sources that we've used Deseret Book as a shorthand for, we could call them LDS sources too, those ones that are written by, let's say, those general authorities and those people who are leaders in the church, that even those, because again, you're taking revelation and you're putting it into human language that actually can't cover, that can't encompass the mysteries of God, then once you get these, you know, the people who are trained in, in theology, we're going back to where did, they, where did they get these ideas from? The same thing happened in the early church, right? There's a sense in which if there's something like a great apostasy, you know, if that's a thing, that's actually a thing now too, right? It slowly creeps its way back in. It's something that's going to happen, right? So the, the, I can think of the first reformer. Most people think of Luther as the first reformer. But Luther knew that Savonarola, Girolamo Savonarola of, of 15th century Florence, was the first reformer. And he, you know, he was very much an Aristotelian in some sense, but he pushed back against teaching, uh, teaching you know, people like himself, preachers in the church, in the Catholic church, via so much of, you know, philosophy and theology and more into, he wanted the, the teaching to be more based on the scriptures and based on the writings of the early church fathers, whereas a lot of it was scholastic, you know, philosoph philosophical training and theological training. So he was an Aquinian, right? He, he followed Aquinas, but he, he still didn't want so much Aristotle. You know, it's one thing to say, let's teach Aristotle. It's another thing to say, let's teach St. Thomas Aquinas, who brought Aristotelianism and tried to, to make Christianity and Aristotelianism fit with each other. But I'm pointing, and it's tricky, I'm trying to point to both an opportunity and a problem at the same time. You see what I mean? Well, I think that same thing manifested in, in our church. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Joseph Smith did not come up with all these original ideas. I mean, there were, there were other theologians and thinkers from which he heavily adopted and then adapted. In the language that he used exactly. to express whatever was revealed to him. Yeah, and that, yeah. that process will continue. In fact, I, I kind of think that's at least part of what's meant by this phrase that we're hearing a lot in recent years, that the restoration is ongoing. You know, as we continue to, to learn from other thinkers, theologians, 
philosophers, whomever, and couple that with our modern day experience and the where society is going, the directions it's going, we're going to be making those same reconciliations between doctrines and dogmas and what actually works in the world based on these new and innovative ways about thinking uh, about spirituality and God and religion that we're pulling in from the outside and then adapting to our own situation. So I think that's part of the ongoing restoration is figuring out how to how to make things work in, in this modern world for our times. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and what I'm trying to say, you know, with this, to, to try to put a finer point on, on what I was saying is that at the same time that we necessarily have to adopt that language and those modes of thinking and that they're also actually beneficial, not that we have to like, oh, geez, we, you know, we don't really want to do this, but we have to. We actually want to. Right? Because there are thinkers who help us to be able to express our ideas more clearly. And at the same time, that's the benefit. At the same time, there's the risk. There's, a, there's always a risk with every reward, right? That, that somehow that we get stuck on those wordings or on those ways of expressing the ideas. And we, in some sense, close ourselves off to further revelation, which is why going back to what you said, Riley, it's so important to be open. Because we can't assume that we have... That, that what we have in so many words, especially when we think about it in terms of in so many words, what's put on paper in black and white, is it. It's not it. It has not all been revealed. Revelation continues. And this is why we say we don't have LDS theology. And at the same time, what has been revealed or what has been expressed out of what has been revealed is wrapped up in the in the way of thinking and, and the context of the people who put it into writing or who speak it. And so we have to be able to progress beyond that and we have to be able to learn from the Spirit. And this is why this is why the, the, the personal relationship that we build in a contemplative relationship with the divine is so important. You know, there's there's this idea in the church that is frequently communicated by leaders of the church. Again, the restoration is ongoing, so we don't have all the truth and we don't have all the answers. But yet the way that we practice and approach theology within the church is from the standpoint or assumption that we do have the answers. And we use those past historical declarations of doctrines and dogmas as the basis for having the answers. And I wonder how much we're just not listening to what leaders of the church are saying when they when they say this stuff's ongoing we're still figuring things out. Yeah, you know, you remind me of something that I've often thought to myself. Sometimes you think, okay, so I've I think I've caught on to something here. I've had personal revelation or I've had an insight or I've had an understanding or I maybe I worked my way through it logically or whatever. And I think that that what I that what I understand is true goes above and beyond what maybe General 30X is saying in his talk in General Conference or something. And then I think, well, maybe he's actually knowing this and not saying it. Or maybe what he's saying actually points to this. Yeah, I've had similar thoughts, very similar thoughts that, you know, I, maybe we're not giving them enough credit for having meat or deeper thoughts when in reality their their job and their calling is very limited. I mean, their their role is to communicate the milk, make sure that there's milk all over the world, <laughs> but but yes. then just subtly point the way towards the meat. And you know, maybe they're, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe that's what's going on. It's hard to know. But I will say this, most of the personal revelatory experience that I've had has been when I've ventured slightly outside the boundaries. Same here. And doesn't that make sense? I mean, does this mean Christopher and Riley have gone astray? <laughs> maybe, maybe. But here's what I'm saying, and I think this is what you're saying too, Riley. If the, ch if the church is only there to teach the basics, if you're going to go outside of the basics, you're going to go outside of the boundaries of the church, which there are the basics. It's necessary. Yeah. I'm, j I'm trying to make a logical argument here, right? Yeah, does that make sense? It, it does, but then you've got you know you've got the occasional quotes by some, whether it's church leaders or whomever, that you know allude to the fact that 
For instance, the thinking has been done when when the pro- prophet of the church speaks, the president of the church thinks. Sure, speaks the, but this uh, has been repudiated done. by prophets right. past and present. It just creates, you know, it, but it does create uncertainty and complexity for the lay person, right? Well, look at yeah, and look at the the line the church has to walk. They're pointing us to to seek further light and truth. The church is asking us to do this, and yet at the same time, we have to be warned about the dangers. Think about the translation when Joseph Smith is translating the Bible and doing what he's calling translation. You have this question that he has of whether to translate the Apocrypha. And what is he told? It's not necessarily to translate it. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's truths there. There's things that are maybe less true. By the way, why doesn't this apply? And I think it does apply. My answer is it does apply to what we call canon. It's no different with the canon than it is with the Apocrypha. These were arbitrary decisions. And as a matter of fact, some of the some of the most controversial teachings that we find in the canon, scholars today are pointing to these are probably pseudepigraphal works, which means they're forgeries. Right? Let's let's call a spade a spade. A pseudepigraphal work is a forgery. You can think of some of the letters of Paul, for example. I realize this is really controversial to say, and yet we can find scholars even within you know academics, even within uh, Latter Day Saint academics, who recognize this. And so we can still take truth, though, just as the Lord was saying to Joseph Smith that people could find truth in the Apocrypha with the guidance of the Spirit. We always are reading, we're supposed to be reading the the Scriptures with the guidance of the Spirit. And so the same thing can happen. So if, for example, the writing that where uh, Paul says that women should be silent in church, and in the same book he says, and this is Paul in scare quotes maybe, uh, that uh, that women should dress modestly. And if we take that to mean something other than what's usually taught in the Book of Mormon, which is, and it really does look like it's more like what uh, our church is teaching us today about uh, covering up, let's say, as, as a shorthand, right? In the Book of Mormon, we learn more about wearing modest apparel in the sense of not costly apparel. In fact, that's what's talked about is, is, is costly apparel, right? And so it's more humble in a sense. But in Paul, you get more like covering up. And this is something that, that's a message that can be valid to a certain extent. And of course, we can take it too far and we can misunderstand it. And it can be pseudepigraphal at the same time. It could be that that's somebody who's not Paul, or maybe even Paul, by the way. What if it is Paul? And he's saying something like, something that has very much to do, as we've been saying here, about it's his time and place and his context and his way of thinking goes into whatever revelation he may be receiving. And so it comes out that way through him. We're getting not the mind of the Lord per se, but the mind of the Lord through the filter of the human being who's a prophet. And so our prophetology has something to do with this. What do we think a prophet is? Do we think that a prophet is taking dictation from the Lord? That's not what our church teaches us, right? So, you know, we can take, and even if it is pseudepigraphal, one way or the other, and we can learn something valuable from it. I love how Rob Bell puts this when he's um, critiquing or evaluating, you know, the scriptural writings of, of various prophets. He says these are real people living real lives in a real time, in a real place. Like he's, he's basically humanizing them and saying, look, they're, we, we can't put them on a pedestal. And, and maybe this is, if we expand this back into the discussion about mentors and gurus, the danger of putting someone on a pedestal is that sometimes you, you, you miss the idea that you know, they're living in real time, have real problems just like we do, and they're dealing with it the best way they can. Um, a lot of times, you know, we look up to a mentor and when they make a mistake, you, you're like, oh man, I can't believe I followed that guy or whatever. But, you know, if we look at them and, and glean the value that we can get out of them um, it, without attributing to them this godlike status, then you can grow. And and maybe this kind of dovetails with what we've been, you know, kind of dancing around this discussion about, you know, church sources versus out of the church sources or whatever. We can derive great value, even from something that's pseudo-epigraphical, like, you know, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene or something like that. Who knows where that was written? Maybe it's canon. Maybe it's real. I don't know. Well, it's not canon, at least for us. It's apocryphal, but maybe it's pseudepigraphal, and maybe it really is written by her. 
But regardless, we know that we can read that tract and come out of it with something without having to attribute to it this higher authority of, of perfection. And, and maybe that's how we should approach mentors in general. Yeah, if we put someone on a pedestal or even, you know, we can, as I've said many times before on the podcast, we can make an idol out of anything, right? So we, we, we should not be an idolatry by making a prophet an idol, by making the scriptures an idol, by making the temple an idol, by making even our very image or understanding or idea of God an idol. We have to be willing to, to we have to understand that prophets and therefore their writings are not infallible, that our idea of God may not quite comprehend all of what God is, no matter how canonical it is, no matter how um, orthodox it is, that, you know, if we say, as I always like to put it, if God has a body, then he fits in a box, right? We just put God in a box and we call that box a coffin, right? And so I think, you know, this is this kind of constraints, God, this doesn't say necessarily he doesn't have a body. It's just that, is that really all there is? I don't know. I have to be open to whatever God reveals to me, whatever God wants to reveal to me. I can't close myself off to a revelation because, no, I've got you in a, in a box, God. And if you don't, if you come at me from somewhere outside that box, I can't accept that. No, I can't make that mistake. I have to be open to receiving God in whatever way he wants to reveal himself to me. You know, something you just said earlier uh, struck me, and we can kind of evaluate the converse of that a little bit or the inverse of it by saying we've heard so much in recent years, you know, that, and it's almost used by apologists way too much, but essentially they'll say, well, the prophets and apostles, they aren't perfect. They're not infallible. And we've heard that so much that it just becomes the opening line for any qualifying statement that someone wants to make, you know, about revelation or leadership in the church or whatever. But the inverse of that is actually just as interesting. By saying that the prophets and apostles are not infallible, it gives us permission to take the best from them without having to, again, ascribe to them some level that's akin to deity. We can just take the best of what they teach us and incorporate that into our discipleship. And if we're willing to do that, why not take that same model and, uh, and use it when we go outside the church and start reading you know, other sources for enlightenment or, or further learning? Why not apply that same standard to them and say, okay, they're also infallible, or excuse me, they're also fallible, but there's a lot that we can learn from them. So let's take the good and incorporate it into our own practice or discipleship. Absolutely. Why not? And seek ye out of the best books as our scriptures teach us. Yeah. This was hinted to, I think, also in that famous interview with Larry King and, and President Hinckley when, when he said, hey, we, we want to take good men and, and make them better. Essentially, that's kind of the same idea. We have some truths for them. We're not saying that we have all the truth or that, you know, we're the only ones who can make him better, but they can learn something from being around us. And the inverse is also true. We can learn from them and we can learn from other masters in other traditions. I think there's a sense that mistakenly some get within the church and not all, certainly, that because of this concept of fullness of the gospel, that why would we waste our time going to these other sources when we have the fullness over here and it's just on us to, you know, learn about that fullness and absorb as much of that fullness as possible. And I think that's a misconstrual of that term and its intent completely. Um, you know, there was a, there was a great uh, episode of uh, another podcast that we, that we listened to where Michael Wilcox was, was interviewed and he talked about the fullness of times as being an accrual of all the times. Yes. And how we can reach back to those prior times and pull truths out of that. And our, our particular and unique situation in this particular moment in time is a blessing because we have everything that came before, not because we have it all in our little box 
in this time right now. It's because we have the accrual of those teachings. Yeah, and not just because it happened earlier and therefore could be available, but because with the technology that we have today, all of us can get access to it. It's not just that it was all said or written before now. Obviously, anything that's been said or written before now that has been recorded and preserved is potentially available to us, but it's actually available. And, and for anybody who has a smartphone, it's right in their pocket. I just have to pull out the smartphone and there it is. I can read all of the scriptures of all of the great religious traditions uh, that, that God has revealed. I love that podcast too. You know, he, he mentions all of the other scriptures, right, that, that God has revealed. Why wouldn't he be talking to, and he said he, he said he was, he said he is. Why wouldn't he be talking to other, all the other peoples of the world? And when he did, if I want to, as Michael Wilcox said, when, he, when did he talk to the Chinese? Oh, Confucius. When did he talk to the, the Indians? Oh, the Bhagavad Gita, right? And other scriptures, the Upanishads, the, the, the Vedas, and so on and so forth. And so, as I've said before, you know, we, we've been taught in our tradition that there are other scriptures you know not of. And I think many tend to think in terms of the, these are the sealed plates or something like that. Some of these scriptures are not sealed. Some of them are not buried and hidden or sealed. They are on the bookshelf at the bookstore and in translation. You don't even have to learn Sanskrit or Arabic or Chinese. You can read them in, in good, you know, scholarly translations in your own language. Let's take a, just a, a short turn here into this topic about some of these other scriptures from other cultures. You know, as, as you've mentioned before, you're deeply into Islamic studies, and we've also spent time reading the Hindu scriptures and, you know, the Tao Te Ching and the Dhammapada and some of these other scriptures. And, you know, there's, there's great truths revealed there, but it also highlights the need, again, coming back to this mentor-protege or guru-disciple relationship, to have someone help you get through those and interpret those for your benefit. Like the first time I read the Bhagavad Gita, I was like, okay, it's it's interesting. You know, it, it's cool. I'm glad I read it. But I cannot even pretend I was like enlightened by this and ready to, you know, move into nirvana state or whatever. It honestly didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, but it was enjoyable and it was nice to have an experience with someone else's canon, someone else's uh, holy book. But yet it helped to highlight for me, most importantly, that if I were really to glean anything from this and s sincerely learn from it, I really need a mentor to help walk me through this. And I think that's true not only of, you know, the, the Bhagavad Gita, but just all of these scriptures. You need someone who has made it their their goal or their life, uh, you know, study and to understand these things, to help open the way for you and really give you more light on this. Yeah. And with that, you know, we've talked about having, you know, doing an episode, recording an episode on, on some of these books, for example, the Gita, we, we both know, I'm sure you've reread it just as I have, and maybe come to understand it a little better. And I know you're reading some commentary on it. We've been uh, looking for an excuse to bring somebody like Phil McLemore back on. We might be able to get him to come on and, and talk about the Gita. And so there's that. And then there's also this idea that we wanted to make sure we brought out, Riley, that is that sometimes our mentors can be books or they can be, they can be living persons that we never actually meet in person. So for, we can read commentaries by gurus without actually being in a guru-disciple relationship with them because either they're living somewhere else where we have no access to them, uh, according to our means, or because they're dead. And then there are mentors uh, on YouTube. There, there, there are living mentors who I don't have access to in person, but whenever they're, they're speaking or whenever they're, they've put something on YouTube, I can listen to it. I can listen to their podcast. I can listen to their, their lectures. And I can learn, I can read their books if they publish books and I can learn from them and they can be my mentor. And who knows, someday I might be able to gain access to them. I have a mentor who, who read everything that Hugh Nibley wrote from his native country of Holland. So 
this means at that time, because he's, I'm 52, he's, he's older than I am. He was my teacher uh, before he became a personal mentor. Again, we started off in that relationship where I'm just a student in his class and it became a closer relationship, mentorship, friendship. We became colleagues because I ended up teaching the subject that I, I studied from him, which is philosophy. But the point is that being as old as he was before the internet, he had to read, reading all those books from there meant the great expense of bringing them from the United States to Holland. And so when he came to the United States and went up to Hugh Nibley and said, hello, I've read all your books. I'd like to talk to you. Guess what Hugh Nibley said? How could he say no? I've read all your books and I'd like to talk to you versus, hey, I'd like to, everybody wants to talk to him, right? But so there's, this is, it brings, brings up another important point that I think we wanted to bring out that is in a mentor protege relationship, we have to respect the time of the mentor. So that's one way that you can do that up front before you even select a mentor to actually do your homework up front. And then once you're in the relationship to continue to do your homework. If your mentor tells you, read this or practice that or do this or do that, and you don't do it, you're not doing your part, right? You're asking the mentor to give of of their time and and share their experience. And then you're not doing something with it. And when it comes to a guru-disciple relationship, they actually actually... They actually need to see where you are, and and this is important in a traditional student-teacher relationship or guru-disciple relationship. You actually have to learn the things from, not from a book, but in- interpret it, as you pointed out, Riley, to have someone to help you understand the book and to comment upon it for you and to be able to fill you out where you are. I had a, a phone call with a, a mentor Sunday. And this is a new mentor. And I called him up and I asked a question. And the first question he asked me was, where are you on this? Before he answered my question, he wanted to know, where am I in my understanding of something foundational to what I was asking about? So that he could then give me the answer that's appropriate to where I am. You see, that's the importance of having that one-on-one relationship and to having that, that kind of living mentor and being in that position. And yet there are books and there are YouTube lectures. Yeah, that's part of the beauty of, again, living in the fullness of times is access to the, this information. I love this point you bring up about it's sort of like an initiate, initiatory test, um, or it could just be a test, you know, where you're literally taking a test to find out where you're at at, at this certain point in time for you so that the mentor can tailor the message without discouraging you perhaps or throwing you into a tailspin, you know, emotionally, whatever the case may be. There's going over your head. Sure. You know, making, having you question everything that you believe in a way that you're not prepared to, you know, something like that. Yeah. I mean, there's a time and a place for, for maybe a shocking pronouncement every once in a while, just to like jolt someone into like a thought process or whatever. But generally speaking, I think, the mentor, it benefits them to know where the protege is at. And isn't that an interesting point to bring out, Riley, in terms of contemplation? When contemplation is about noticing, and we've said this before, that the first question is, where am I? Right? That's the first question of contemplation. And so the mentor actually plays a role in helping you answer that question. Because when he's or she is asking you this question, it's not just for them, right? They're asking you, in a way that you also get to notice where you are. The two of you are working together for you to notice where you are. And that's what the best teachers do. The best mentors and best teachers assess where someone is by asking great questions. I mean, I I think the essence of a good gospel doctrine teacher, for instance, is someone who can formulate and ask really good questions that get people thinking about answers without guiding them into your answer, you know, without manipulating the situation, but just getting them to think, well, where am I? That's pure contemplation. Yeah. Well, Christopher, we've had a what I think is a great conversation, and it's actually motivating me to seek out those opportunities on both sides of the mentor-mentee, mentor-protege protege relationship, because I'm beginning to see more of the benefit in being both a student and a master. And so for me, I, 
I'm going to go forward with my eyes open to the opportunities. Yeah, you know, I'd like to take the opportunity uh, in this to go on record here in this recording to thank my mentors who at least one or two of them may be listening. And it's because of the personal interest that they've taken in me and, and who may have recognized the stories I've told about them as having, because they're just recent conversations that I've had. I've talked to my mentors today. I talked to a mentor today. I talked to a mentor, uh, an old mentor today and, and a new mentor on Sunday, just yeah, what two days ago. I'm grateful for my mentors and and they, they've made a big difference in my life in terms of my spiritual and intellectual development. And I couldn't have done it without them. And so I'm grateful for them. I thank them. And I seek and I'm open to further opportunities to enter into a relationship with a mentor where I'm willing to do the work and to honor them and their time and to learn from them. Well, Christopher, I appreciate the conversation and, and I appreciate our relationship. You've been a mentor to me in many respects. And so I, I much appreciate that. Likewise. Well, for Latter-day Contemplation, I'm Riley Risto. And I'm Christopher Hurtado. Have a great week, everyone.